is looking at um, a Darwin Plus project, which is a technical assistance programme for effective coastal marine management in the Turks and Caicos Islands. And these are a series of knowledge exchange um, virtual workshop series. So as I've already mentioned in this first session, um, we will have an introduction to the project, um, talk about the purpose and then cover some marine management techniques which will be covered throughout the workshops um, before we move on to looking at sensitivity assessments. So I'm going to give a brief introduction to who JNCC are, then we're um, hoping to do a round table of introductions. Um, look at the project background um, and the purpose of the workshop series. And then, as I've already said, move on to pressures and sensitivity assessments, links to vulnerability assessments, and then um, have opportunity for questions. So JNCC, or the Joint Nature Conservation um, Committee, the public body that advises the UK government and devolved administration on UK-wide and international nature conservation. We provide high quality evidence and advice on the natural environment, provide practical policy relevant solutions to support decisions, and also provide a shared service to governments and public bodies and work in partnership with business and society. There are approximately 270 scientific, technical and support staff which are based predominantly in Peterborough and in Aberdeen in the UK. But we also have staff posted in Wales, Northern Ireland, the Falkland Islands, and also increasingly within our key stakeholder organisations. So JNCC has a long-standing programme of working with overseas territories and Crown dependencies. Um, this is helping to protect significant biodiversity, building regional knowledge and also supporting natural capital initiatives, such as developing a green economy in the Turks and Caicos, Anguilla and Falkland Islands, and also economic evaluation of natural assets. Um, so an introduction um, to the project. Um, so this is the technical assistance programme for effective coastal marine management in TCI. Um, it was, was a three year project, so it started in August 2020 and is ending in July this year. Um, in terms of uh, partnerships, so it's TCI governments, DCR, JNCC and SERI. And the project is funded by the UK Darwin Plus, sorry, Darwin Plus initiative. The overall get goal is to develop um, technical capacity and evidence to support status assessment and management programmes in TCI's coastal and marine environments. And that's by developing technical tools and methods to enhance the evidence base for effective um, assessment and management of marine and coastal resources, and also providing support and training in using and applying these developed tools and methods through a knowledge exchange programme. So just a bit of a background um, to the project. Uh, JNCC has been working with DCR for a number of years and have some example uh, projects listed there or areas um, been working on. So disaster resilience management, habitat mapping and modelling, natural capital accounting, the 25 year environment indicator development and the strategic environmental management. Uh, DCR um, have requested additional assistance from JNCC to help build um, technical capacity in a range of areas. And there's an underlining um, um, MOU defining the partnership um, with an annual work plan. And this is um, sort of where the, the project was conceived from um, in response to request for building technical capacity in DCR and with wider um, TCI government and TCI stakeholders. So the project has um, two main components um, that are interrelated. So the first one um, is technical development of tools and methods to enhance the evidence base needed to support effective assessment and management of marine and coastal resources. 
and um, this component has focused on marine habitat mapping, developing a marine natural capital asset register, creation of ecosystem service maps and flows, status and vulnerability assessments of habitats and assets, um, development of indicators to monitor change, and also data management tools and systems. And the um, information in, in brackets um, just highlights which work package of the project um, each one of those refers to. So the second component of the project is the Knowledge Exchange Programme. And this component is focusing on providing support and building capacity in using and applying methods, tools and techniques that have been developed under the project and also stakeholder engagement and communication. So this slide here um, looks at uh, cross project connections. Um, I'm not going to read e each project out, um, but because there's a lot of information on, on the slide, um, but just to give an idea that there are a number of different uh, projects and interconnections. So we have the Darwin Plus funded projects and also other projects and programmes. Okay, so the purpose um, of the workshops, um, and these are online workshops that we're talking about, um, are to deliver the techniques um, developed through this project for understanding, monitoring and valuing waters um, surrounding TCI, to deliver training in applying these techniques for effective environmental management, and to invite feedback and discussion to improve the techniques and inform their future use. Um, so we have the dates for the online workshops here, and there are also in-person workshops um, occurring at the end of June. Um, so in the diagram, there are a number of different techniques which we looked at and covered. So one around marine pressures and sensitivity assessment, which will be covered today. Then there's a workshop, um, online workshop tomorrow, looking at marine status vulnerability assessments. There's one on marine biodiversity indicators and then one on marine natural capital and ecosystem services. I thought I might have seen a hand go up. Is Sorry, I, I didn't see who it was. Apologies. I think the hand's gone back down. OK. Um, yeah, a misclick. <laughs> I will, I will continue. Um, yeah, and apologies um, when I'm sharing screens, I, I can't uh, can't see everyone. I just get <laughs> glimpses of, of a hand going up. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, this is um, sort of talking about the tools that we've been using or developing in terms of the toolkit and the evidence base. So this is based around sort of uh, four main questions we might want to to ask and it's a bit like um, I guess visiting a uh, sort of a medical practice um, continuum monitoring is important and early also early diagnosis um, so in order to answer these questions um, there's some tools um, that have been developed as part of the, the project so the first one uh, looking at how sensitive is the sea to pressures so um, in order to look at this um, it's important to look at activities and pressures and also habitat sensitivity to pressures. Then to identify um, areas where there's the biggest risk um, in order to do this, um, vulnerability assessments can be used as a tool. And then um, to look at how the health has changed. So condition indicators can be used for this. And then why um, does the ecosystem health matter? Um, and this is where um, natural capital and services that are provided um, by the ecosystems um, can be used as tools um, to, to try and answer these questions. So um, slide here, we have a number of, of key questions that we'd like to sort of start, start thinking about. Um, got yeah, sort of four main questions here. So first one is, is the health of the sea improving 
or declining, which marine habitats are under the biggest threats, where is the biggest risk to seabed habitats and how does this risk um, affect people. So I'd just like um, to have the opportunity um, for people to, to come in and, and answer some of these questions. It can, doesn't have to be in order, it doesn't have to be all the questions, but just if you, yeah, if you would like um, to, um, yeah, to, to answer any of the questions. We, I think we have a, a bit of time, Emma, sorry, how much time have we got just to, to have these discussions? Um, I'd say about 10 minutes or so, so we'll leave in a, an hour for, for Johnny's session. Great, thank you. And also just to say these questions will um, be referred to tomorrow as, as well. So it's sort of, um, yeah, making sure, um, yeah, sort of starting to think about these, these um, important questions. Um, Chris, would you like to come in? Um, regarding question two, and I, um, I think this this kind of bodes well for a lot of things that was said before, is that um, I think it has to do with e e each each problem that we may be facing, whether it be um, managing a particular area, um, sargassum, um, corals, um, any invasive alien species. Um, marine debris, what what I find may be one of the biggest hurdles to overcome is how fragmented the islands are. And that really um, provides a challenge when it comes to getting personnel, getting resources, getting getting equipment, especially heavy equipment, if it is that we have a big um, flood of sargassum on the beaches, um, getting that involvement um, involved, um, reaction to to any natural disasters usually um, takes precedence in the, in the residential areas, um, whether that be Provo, Grand Turk, South Caicos, and then um, the rural side kind of doesn't get the attention that it needs and the assessment that it needs. So it, it kind of um, encum um, encum encumbers a whole lot of the um, workload that we have in terms of adequately monitoring and serving and reacting to the that country because the islands and keys are so um, far away from each other, especially when it came when it comes to reactions. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, Alexandra? Oh. Um. So to go through some of the questions, um, I would say that um, the health of our marine systems is declining for various reasons. Um, I'd personally say that the coral reefs are perhaps under the largest threat. Uh, again, with um, the stony coral tissue loss disease, which is having a dramatic impact on the reefs, um, but also through climate change, which is obviously impacting the coral reefs resilience, um, threatening their bios biodiversity, threatening their capacity to grow their skeletons and be more resilient to hurricane storms. Um, and with that, I'd say perhaps climate change would be one of the biggest risks um, to our marine ecosystems, but I would also say um, globalization or um, biosecurity with more ships and vessels moving around and m increased opportunities for marine invasives to be introduced. So like our lionfish that were introduced, um, like the invasive seagrass that was introduced, a couple other species that have been introduced into the region as well, um, but also um, with having vessels transporting um, diseases and pathogens. The diadema disease outbreak that's um, started affecting the region last year and is starting to affect the region again this year. Fortunately, TCI not being affected as yet, but um, the diadema species being critical for maintaining the coral reef ecosystem's health. Um, 
how does that affect people with TCI being um, so dependent upon our tourism and our tourism being highly dependent on our environment, primarily our marine environment. And so with that, if we have a decline in our quality of our tourism products, you know, that may potentially have knock-on effects eventually on um, our tourism economy, um, but also knock-on effects on our fisheries and, um, you know, all our alternative, um, I guess, exports. Yeah, thank you. That's, yeah. Covered all the questions there. But if any anyone else would like to input thoughts as well, or um, please feel free to like um, type in the chat if you'd prefer. And we'll we'll jot some of these responses down and yeah come back to them in in tomorrow's session as well if if people are available available to come and they'll help inform that yeah. are there any more hands up at the moment should i and uh, no not at the moment happy Okay, shall I move on to the, yeah, so I'll move on to the last um, slide in this introduction session. Um, so this is actually a, a pre-workshop question um, about the um, marine sensitivity and vulnerability assessments. Um, so the question is around how do you rank your current understanding of methods to assess the health of the marine environment? So there is a question on Slido. So if you're able to, with your laptop or, or perhaps a phone, um, go to slido.com and then enter the code. Um, so it's the code 2530843. So it's the, the uh, code in bold and um, able to, to rate your response. Um, I should say responses are anonymous. Um, and it allows yeah to, to sort of get an idea of um of of your your rank of your current understanding. Thanks, Laura. I think that can just kind of go on in the background. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. In that case, um, I will. Um, that brings us to the end of um, of this introduction session. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I will stop sharing and now hand over to to Johnny. Thanks, Laura. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, just share my screen. Uh, yeah, I'm Johnny Savage. I'm a Marine Evidence Manager at JNCC, where I manage our UK data on activities, pressures, uh, sensitivity and sensitivity aggregations, which we use for marine conservation advice. So it's a pleasure to do a similar sort of thing, looking at activities, pressures and sensitivity in TCI as part of work package two of this project. So the end goal of uh, work package two was to create uh, vulnerability maps and assessments. And these kind of help determine which pressures we need to worry about for marine management and marine spatial planning. And so the vulnerability is really a measure of how much the habitat is exposed to a pressure that it's sensitive to. So in order to create these vulnerability maps, we first need to have a good idea of um, where the habitats are, which species they contain, and how sensitive those species are to pressures but also know where the pressures and the activities are. So we'll combine the habitat maps and sensitivity information with maps of pressures and activities, and these together create the vulnerability maps. The vulnerability maps will be covered in more detail in 
tomorrow's session, which will be led by David. Um, but today I'll cover kind of both these aspects um, that make up vulnerability and how we kind of captured and recorded these in TCI as part of this work package. So as I said, there's like a cycle of data that's needed first before you get to the vulnerability assessments. So it starts the activities data, which is to know uh, where these activities occur, which activities occur, and uh, kind of how the intensity at which these activities occur. Then we look at the activity pressure links. So this uh, links an activity to the pressures. So this is a measure of which particular kind of damage or interaction a activity has with the seabed. So it's important to know all the pressures which are kind of exerted on the seafloor from the activities. Then we need to know, have our habitat maps, so we need to know where the species are and what species we've got in order to map out accurately. So this is where having really high quality data is important to know exactly where the species are. Um, and the last part we're talking about is sensitivity scores. So these are our sensitivity assessments where we kind of assess how much damage a particular pressure does to those species that we've just identified from our habitat maps. And all of these things together will be used to create our vulnerability tools. So the first uh, bit we're going to talk about is the activities data. Um, so I've got an interactive exercise using Slido, which is just what activities do you know that occur in TCI? So if you could go to uh, slido.com um, and the code that you'll need is on the bottom of the screen. It's a 209106. Um, and it's just a word cloud exercise. So you can just put in any activities that um, that you can think of. So these can be a whole whole range of activities, it can be commercial or recreational. Uh, things that might have direct or indirect impacts um, on, the, on the marine environment, as well as any kind of terrestrial activities which may have um, impacts which kind of also affect the marine environment. I know it says activities, but it can also be um, like structures in the marine environment which could affect uh, the seafloor. I can see some people have managed to get in and start um, putting some answers in, which is great. And also, if people aren't able to get into Slido, um, feel free to put any uh, additional thoughts you have in the chat, and we can make sure those are captured as well. Or if anything, um, you can you know, raise your hand and make a comment as well if you think of any additional activities. This was an exercise we also carried out at the start of this project, I think in August 2021, um, at a stakeholder workshop with um, yeah, colleagues from DECR and SARI and various other TCI stakeholders. Uh, it's be interesting to see if uh, your thoughts match up for what you currently think, the activities in TCI and what we initially recorded at the start of the project that we kind of used to create our initial activities and pressures list.
a couple more minutes on that. Are people are still writing. That's great, I'm sure. Right. Stop that there. Thank you everyone for your input. And we can just quickly have a look at the, the results. Um, so it seems like yeah, the, the larger, the larger words, the ones that have been typed more often. So there's a lot of uh, identification of uh, fishing, diving, snorkeling as well as some recreation activities like jet skis and cruises um you know and a whole variety of other uh, touristy activities so if we compare that to what we what we had from our stakeholder workshop um it is reassuring to see that lots of them match up um so from there we had um some of the bigger things like the ferry routes and the cruise ships coming in um, as well as smaller power boats and sailing boats uh, and the associated kind of moorings and then the piers and marinas, uh, some navigational dredging for the larger larger boats, as well as things like the, the sports fishing, the more recreational and tourist activities like the sports fishing, and then uh, like fishing for lobster and conch, as well as the wrecks and sewage runoff. So th these were also taken from the TCI data portal because um, it's really important to know where these activities occur. So as, as well as knowing that there are um, you know, jet skis, we need to know where the jet skis are to be able to, to map that pressure footprint to use them in conjunction with the seven sensitivity assessments um, to create our vulnerability maps. So having high quality data about where the activities occur is also vital to kind of get the best possible picture. So the next stage in our vulnerability tool cycle is looking at the activity pressure links. And this allows us to convert an activity into the effect it has on the environment. So we define a pressure as a mechanism for which an activity has an effect on any part of the ecosystem. And the nature of this pressure is determined by the activity type, intensity, and distribution. Uh, a single activity can have multiple associated pressures. And it's important to kind of consider that an activity, the pressures an activity possess can vary depending on, on the life cycle. So for like a marina or a harbour, there can be very different pressures from the, the construction of that site to its operation and even its eventual decommissioning. So it's important to consider all these things when trying to capture all possible pressures um, that an activity can have. So in order to convert these activities to pressures, um, at JNCC we have our pressures activities database, and this holds a wide range of data on a whole um, list of activities, and then it associates pressures with them and gives them an RPP score. Um, that's the second to right column, and it's a risk profile and a pressure, and that indicates the general risk to the environment the pressure poses under normal circumstances. And for this work and our work in the UK, we only look at pressures which have a medium high risk. Um, so low ones aren't considered high enough to be um, to look at for, in terms of sensitivity. So the activities from our stakeholder workshop were then matched the closest equivalent in our pressure activity database. Um, and then from there, you can see the associated pressures. So here's this example of the ones that came out in our extraction of living resources category. Um, so they were diving for lobster and conch. And you can see the only associated pressure there is the removal of target species. Or a thing like line fishing also has um, aberration disturbance of the substrate from when a fishing line might get caught on, on the seabed. Um, but it also has removal of non-target species to account for any bycatch. Uh, there will always be some duplication of pressure between activities 
uh, especially ones within a similar activity category. Um, but we only look at, at the, we remove these duplications when we create our pressure matrix. And then we took all the activities from the workshop to create our final list of pressures. So this final list of pressures came out as a pressure activity matrix. So this spanned eight different active categories, which range from coastal infrastructure, uh, which I think was mentioned on our word cloud, uh, to things like recreation and leisure, transport, and the extraction of living and non-living resources. Uh, we had 20 activities, um, so things like land reclamation and beach extraction, as well as um, all things related to boats. So that's the movements, moorings, berths, and anchorages. Um, and some additional things like the culture and heritage sites. So this includes like shipwrecks, um, but also any structures or sculptures which may be on the beach or on the seafloor. Um, and in total, we had 27 pressures. So this is a little snapshot of our pressure activity matrix um, that resulted from this. Um, so we had things in there like the sewage disposal, which has a whole range of pressures which uh, you may not consider such as water above noise and then range the things like the nutrient and organic enrichment as well as um, underwater noise and visual disturbance. So our next interactive activity um, is thinking about pressures and which ones are a priority. Um, so this is another Slido. Um, so it's on the same link and the same code if you could uh, join again. And for this task, I've lifted, listed uh, I think 24 pressures here that came about from our stakeholder workshop. And I'd like you to try and rank a top 10 uh, from one to 10 of which ones you think are kind of the most important to think about in terms of sensitivity and the effect that they might have um, on the environment. Um, we've also included our climate change pressures on the edge, which weren't initially raised in our workshop, um, but we have included them here as and, uh, climate change is, is a big factor and is having some worrying impacts all over the world. Um, so I think it's important to also consider not just pressure, but think about the activities which cause them. And if there's a high intensity of activities which might cause um, surface abrasion, but also think about the pressures themselves. Like I know earlier on, we mentioned um, stony coral tissue loss disease and the greatest worries, um, which should be the introduction of microbial pathogens. Um, so there's a whole range here. So we could use the slider to have a rank. We can have a, a conversation about which ones you think are the most important to, to consider in terms of sensitivity and vulnerability mapping. If anyone has any questions or any of the particular pressures, uh, please feel free to ask, I'll try and explain them. Everyone managed to access Slido OK. If anyone in the in the call has any any thoughts about which pressure in particular they think is a priority, please feel free to to. Uh, have a comment.
It looks like the amount of replies are slowing down, so we'll just give it another 30 seconds and then have a look at your rankings. OK, so it looks like um, we've ranked removal of target species as the, the top priority, then introduction of non-native species, uh, introduction of mycorrhizal pathogens, abrasion to the seabed, uh, temperature changes, nutrient enrichment, ocean warming, uh, physical change of seabed, uh, marine heat waves, and barriers to species movement. Uh, from our workshops we came up with a, a streamlined list of eight pressures um, so that was abrasion and also penetration of the substrate below the seabed uh, physical change to another seabed type or sediment type physical loss smothering and siltation uh, the introduction of microbial pathogens and organic enrichment we came to these uh, these priority pressures uh, through discussions at our stakeholder workshop as well as looking at uk habitats um, which are similar, like our seagrass beds, to determine which pressures have the highest sensitivity to. So it's really interesting as well that you've you know, I've identified the microbial pathogens and abrasions of the seabed um, and organic enrichment. So it's good that our assessments are on a similar thought to pressures that you were thinking about. So the next step in our vulnerability tools is the habitat maps. So for the sensitivity assessment, it's kind of really vital to know which species it is we're trying to assess. And then for the vulnerability assessment, it's really important to know where those habitats are, but also where the pressures are to know where those two overlap. So in this project, we used uh, the habitat map from the Nature Conservancy using their habitat classifications and descriptions. Uh, so here we can see uh, Turks and Caicos with the various, you know, uh, seagrass, the sand, and the coral habitats. And for this project, uh, we agreed that we'd look at three broad habitat groups. Um, so this is through discussions with our stakeholders at the workshop um, and email discussions after that. Um, so we agreed that we'd look at the seagrass, which combines the dense and the sparse classifications from Nature Conservancy, uh, coral reef. Um, and the sand. Uh, a, see, a sensitivity assessment can be written for any habitat or even a single species. Um, so for this project, we had three quite broad groups, which then ended up covering a large amount of the marine habitat. Um, but this does make the individual assessments uh, less precise. If you're having a broad group, there's quite a lot of species within them, um, which can all react slightly differently to a pressure. So if you have a better idea um, of the species, um, in your habitats, um, you can create a, a more specific sensitivity assessment. So you could look at a specific species of seagrass rather than a general assessment for all of them, or for a specific type of coral, like a branching coral, would probably react very differently to the massive corals. And then these more specific sensitivity assessments could be fed into the vulnerability tools to create a more accurate um, more accurate maps for use in marine spatial planning. So the habitats that we did look at were a coral reef. So these were the, the coral and algae species. Um, so this focused on the branching Acropora species, as well as several massive species, so the Montastra, Orbicilla, Pseudodiplora, and Diplora. Uh, our seagrass assessment combined the dense and the sparse seagrass classifications. Uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce those because uh, I know I can't. And our sand assessment um, focused on algae species. Now, the classification does specify that it's less than 10% living cover. But the species which are there are um, yeah, Halameda and Colopa and the red algae Laurencia. And the habitat descriptions weren't very precise, so future work to better define the habitats around TCI and like ground truthing 
um, to ensure the assessments are focused on the correct species um, would be very important. And the final step in what we get to vulnerability maps is our sensitivity scores. Um, so these kind of bring together our activities data and the pressure links along with our habitat maps to know which species we've got and then looks at the sensitivity. Uh, so sensitivity is kind of the real the, the tolerance of a species or habitat to damage from external factor and how long it takes to recover. So it's a combination of resistance, um, which is really how much damage does the pressure do to the habitat? Um, and resilience, which is how long does the habitat then take to recover from that damage? So the method that we use to assess sensitivity is our marine evidence-based sensitivity assessment, also known as the MARISA method. And this was developed by the Marine Biological Association in the UK. So this does require a detailed knowledge of the species that you're writing the assessment about, as well as a full literature review and kind of evidence and data of their tolerance and recovery. And this outputs a sensitivity score of high, medium, low, or not sensitive. This method uses benchmarks for the assessment, which just sets the level of the pressure um, to score sensitivity against. And these benchmarks can be quantitative, such as how does the species react being like buried under 30 centimeters of sediment, or qualitative, uh, which is just like the level of damage of, to surface features. And by having these set benchmarks, it helps to maintain consistency between the assessments. Uh, resistance and sensitivity are scored separately. Um, and then we combine these scores to get an overall sensitivity score. So here's a quick overview of the outputs from our sensitivity scores. Um, as you can see, the corals were highly sensitive to almost all our pressures, apart from our light smothering and siltation, uh, whereas the sand um, was much less sensitive and only highly sensitive to physical change and physical loss pressures. Um, we only assessed eight pressures over the course of this project, um, but in a future work could look at many other pressures, and there's a whole list of 30 or 40. Um, and we can link these back to your previous worries from the start, so the ones that you think are the most important to consider while thinking about the health of the seas around TCI. Um, so things like the climate change uh, pressures um, would be a great place to look, as well as some of the more fishing related pressures like the removal of target and non target species. So it's really important to have the data for which species you've got, as well as some of the baselines for these pressures um, to know what the change is and what what humans are doing differently to measure sensitivity against. So that's the end of my quick, not that quick overview of um, the sensitivity part of work package two. Um, so if you have any questions about that, uh, please put them in the chat or raise your hand. Would so the question in the chat, would we be able to do this type of assessment for habitat function as well? Um, what do you mean in terms of habitat function? If you're able to clarify. So the assessment really looks at you know, the biological. You could uh, try and apply the method if you knew which kind of species were providing that function and then did an assessment on species which provided them but the method is mostly based um kind of purely on like a biological how does this species react to that pressure and then how fast will it recover so i think it'd be quite tricky to make it work for habitat function i think habitat function will be covered in a, a later work package and how, how that's all related i'm just going to move on uh, and problem and quickly for another presentation which is a bit more detail about how the method for the sensitivity assessment works um, uh, and i'll be going through uh, an example of the seagrasses that we did um, as part of this project to kind of put the sensitivity in a bit more context um, in case yeah it will make a bit more sense uh, if there are any questions at any time, please feel free to you know raise a hand or put them in the chat and I'll try and answer them. 
so the Marisa method um, has uh, like seven stages. So this is our big sensitivity assessment tool. So we review the literature um, about our chosen habitat. Then we identify the elements for the feature. So this is very picking those key characterizing species that you want to focus your assessment on. Then you look at the evidence for how the pressure affects those species. And this goes into your resistance and your resilience scores, which you then use uh, and combine those together for your sensitivity assessment. And then we assess the confidence just so we can, when we publish the, the assessment, we know how good the underlying data is and how much we can rely on it to be an accurate representation of the habitat sensitivity. And then we document all the evidence so that we can refer back to how we've come to our conclusions. And then we repeat the uh, this cycle per pressure um, and per habitat until you've completed all your assessments. So review the literature. Ideally, we use uh, peer reviewed um, literature from journals, but we can also include, um, you know, government reports, water monitoring assessments, um, uh, academic papers and thesis. And then we'll we moving on to a habitat description. So this is the habitat description of the seagrasses from the Nature Conservancy. Um, so the key part here for us is uh, the identification of the species that were in this group. So then looking at uh, so resilience, after oh, our resistance, so this is how much the pressure affects the species. So the ability of the habitat to absorb disturbance or stress without changing character. And we assess this separately for each pressure. So every pressure has a separate resistance score. And this is set against the benchmark level for that pressure. Resistance is scored from none to high. So if a habitat had no resistance to pressure, uh, that's when it is reduced by over 75% of its extent, density or abundance. A low resistance is if the pressure reduces the habitat by 25 to 75%. Medium if it loses, if the loss is less than 25%. And high if there's no significant effect of the pressure on the habitat. So the pressures that we looked at um, in this project were the physical loss, physical change, abrasion to the seabed, penetration of substrate below the seabed and smothering and siltation. We also looked at the introduction of microbial pathogens and also organic enrichment. So these are our benchmarks. So these are what we are assessing sensitivity against in each case. So for physical loss, we're assessing what would happen to that habitat if there was a permanent loss of the existing marine habitat. The physical change is what would happen to the habitat if the sediment changed from a soft to a hard rock, or also if the substrate changed, such as if it changed from sand to gravel or sand to mud. Um, or the abrasion pressure, we're looking at the damage done to the sea surface, um, and that can be from a range of factors, such as trawling or from anchors from mooring sites. And penetration pressure is looking at the damage to the subsurface of the seabed. And our smothering and siltation looks at the effects on the habitat of adding five centimeters of material and 30 centimeters of material. So for that pressure, we have two criteria, a heavy and a light. The biological is just looking at the introduction of the pathogen. So I think in the TCI, we looked heavily at the introduction of stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, and we also looked at uh, organic enrichment. So this was water with a total organic carbon quality, total organic carbon greater than 1.67 milligrams per liter. For this pressure, we had to do some additional work to adapt our benchmarks to the Caribbean. Um, so the initial benchmark was written for the UK. Um, so we conducted a literature review to look at uh, average organic carbon content of the Caribbean seas. And then we adapted our benchmark based on that. Although we didn't cover them in this project, uh, we do also have a series of climate change pressures, um, 
which we have also adapted for the Caribbean for another work uh, in the British Virgin Islands. Um, so if there was interest um, for additional assessment based on the climate change pressures, we'd be happy to share those. Um, so this just looks at the situation under various climate change scenarios. So the global warming, um, it's, you know, what is the increase in sea surface temperature under the climate scenario A1B, which is an increase in temperature by 1.8 degrees. And then you would assess your sensitivity to see how your species would react to an increase in temperature. And then you get your sensitivity uh, from there, which can be used for your vulnerability maps. The other component of sensitivity is resilience. So this is the ability of the habitat to recover from disturbance or stress. So this assessment assumes that the pressure has stopped uh, and the habitat is back under the, its conditions from prior to the pressure. Um, so if a trawl went over a seabed, uh, a seagrass bed, uh, the resilience assessment assumes that no more damage would be done and it'd be allowed to recover naturally. It's recorded separately from resilience and applies to all the pressures. It depends on the scale of the impact um, and there's a separate assessment for each resistance. Um, so it's basically a measure of how long will it take for the habitat to recover to its uh, previous condition. Um, so this ranges from very low to high, so very low re resilience. Um, it will take at least 25 years for the habitat to recover. A low resilience, it will take uh, 10 to 25 years, medium resilience, two to 10 years, and high resilience for recovery within two years. There are some uh, caveats to this. We have some pressures where resilience is always very low. So for our physical loss pressures, which is uh, physical loss of habitat and a physical change of seabed type and sediment type, uh, resilience is always very low because this is a permanent change to the seabed um, and recovery is not possible for the habitat. So sensitivity is a combination of our resistance and our resilience. Yeah. So we combine our resistance scores with our resilience scores um, to get our overall sensitivity. And we also have some other sensitivity scores which can occur during the assessment. So a not relevant is if the pressure and the habitat are not directly linked. Uh, so in the UK, we have some deep sea habitats uh, and one of the pressures is wave exposure. Obviously things in the deep sea aren't exposed to waves, so that would be a not relevant pressure. No evidence is used if there isn't enough evidence to fully assess the sensitivity. And are not assessed as if the evidence is limited or poorly understood, um, so that we can't quite understand how that pressure affects the habitat. Once we've finished our sensitivity assessment, we look at our confidence. So the resistance and the resilience are independently scored for confidence. And these then combine to give the sensitivity confidence score. We have three categories, which is the quality of evidence, the degree to which the evidence is applicable, and the level of agreement between evidence sources. So the confidence, um, so the quality of evidence is looking at uh, what is the source. So that's like, is it a peer reviewed journal paper? Is it from a government report? Uh, is it expert judgment? The applicability of the evidence is looking at where is the evidence based. So if it was looking at the pressure um, acting on your characterizing species in the Caribbean, that'd be high. But a low confidence for that um, might be if you're looking at a closely related species in another tropical environment. So not where you actually want to do your assessment. And a degree of concordance is just do all your evidence sources agree with each other about the direction and the magnitude of the effect the pressure has on the environment. And similarly to um, sensitivity, we combine our resistance and resilience scores for each pressure um, to give our confidence assessment. Um, so the actual documents um, with our sensitivity assessments, we record all the evidence, 
Um, so at the top we have a table which lists the resistance and resilience and sensitivity scores along with their associated confidence scores. Uh, we summarize the evidence that we've used for this assessment. Uh, and then we have a paragraph at the end which explains how the evidence uh, results in that particular score. I'll just quickly run through uh, an example using our seagrass assessment for the abrasion pressure. Um, so for this assessment we looked at three different species of seagrass. Um, we reviewed the evidence that was available um, for seagrass in the Caribbean to look at how various sources of abrasion have affected it. This could be from anchors, from trawling. Uh, then we look at our pressure benchmark. And then we score our resistance, uh, looking at that evidence and kind of determine which of those categories it falls under. So our resistance uh, to abrasion was low based on the evidence. So that's a uh, or a loss of 25 to 75% the extent of seagrass. We look at our resilience. So this is data on how quickly does seagrass grow, looking at reproduction rates, um, how fast it can spread. And here we see that where resistance is medium or low, uh, resilience is medium. So we combine these together um, and we get an overall sensitivity of medium. We look at our confidence categories. So resistance, uh, quality of evidence, it was high. Our applicability, applicability of evidence was a medium. Degree of concordance was medium. And for our resilience, we had high, high and medium. Uh, so these combine to give an overall high, medium and medium uh, confidence in our sensitivity assessment. Uh, this methodology is then repeated for each pressure. So you have our overall sensitivity scores and all of this is then uh, combined with our habitat maps and pressure information to create the vulnerability maps that David will be talking about in more detail tomorrow. That's the end of my quick summary of uh, sensitivity assessments that we used in this project. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. It was really interesting. I guess um, even <laughs> I'm thinking questions around where, you know, it, these sensitivity assessments could be um, could be applied next or where they would be most valuable. Just if anyone has any thoughts, please, and yeah, feel free. It's a good opportunity to ask. Yeah, unfortunately, we can only look at a small range of pressures uh, in mm -hmm. this project, but there's definitely a lot of uh, future work that could look at a larger suite of pressures, um, as well as kind of looking in more detail at uh, breaking down the habitat classifications into smaller groups, so that the assessments are kind of more more precise by being able to look at fewer species. And the climate change pressures especially, um, I'd say, were important to do. Uh, to kind of map out where the, the vulnerability is there for, for the uh, yeah, change. I think that was the last part of your presentation, wasn't it, Johnny, for today's session? Yes, that was it for today. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow we'll be um, continuing with uh, David's session. And yeah, I see you've just popped up, David, so I don't know if you wanted to say anything about um, yeah, what to expect tomorrow leading on from, from Johnny's presentation. Johnny's uh, description of the sensitivity work uh, is a nice lead into what we'll talk about, about the vulnerability assessment. Part of the aim of doing vulnerability assessment is to come to an estimate of the condition, which is how well the reefs are doing, how well the seagrass is doing. And, uh, from a very sort of spatial kind of uh, approach. Um, it builds on 
the sensitivity work to a high degree. So the detail that you've just been hearing is fairly important to that. It also links into indicators and part of what we want to go through tomorrow and to hopefully engender some discussion uh, with everybody is what is the most appropriate me method at any particular time? Because one of the each method has its merits and also has its disadvantages and particularly want to look at how discussion that we've had in the past about monitoring and uh, data management go into this um, and also in, in terms of how it goes into the wider uh, arena of looking at management of marine spatial planning and where the implications are for using this as an effective tool and what you need to do to decide whether to use it as an effective tool. So it's um, focusing on that, that most of the, uh, I think in many ways the, the sensitivity work is critical to this. Um, it's can take a little while to get your head on to exactly what's what's happening there, but it's the it's the biological response, and this is all about how the biodiversity itself, the elements of biodiversity, are reacting to changes in pressures and activities. Um, getting the sensitivity assessment right is a key part of all that. So I enjoyed that talk. I mean, every time I hear it, I always think about something new. Um, but I hope we can pick up some of the, the threads tomorrow and uh, hope to see you all there. And uh, so I'll hand back to Emma and Laura, who's running the day. So um, I haven't really got anything more to add at this stage. Um, thanks. Yeah, I, I guess if if no one had any more um, questions or thoughts they wanted to, to share, um, I suppose we, we can close for today. Um, and I did just want to mention that if you had any feedback on the session um please like feel free to share it and i'll pop yeah <laughs> another slido which i'll pop in the chat if you would like to to share um at any time but yep yeah, uh jatavia i can see you've got your hand up no i just wanted to thank you emma and the team for hosting this workshop and the workshops that are to come throughout this month and then i want to thank um, the various representatives from the departments. Thank you for joining this workshop. I hope you guys will learn some things to take back. And I hope you also join the upcoming workshops that we have for the Durham Plus 119 project. Thank you guys and have a great afternoon. Yeah, thanks for Jatovia and for your help in organising as well. And cheers everyone for attending. Hope it was, um, yeah, hope it was useful. Thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah, uh, yep. please feel free to get in contact if you have any further questions about sensitivity assessments. Um, my email is just johnny.savage at jncc.gov.uk. Happy to answer any questions. And yeah, thank you for attending. Thank you, Johnny Savage. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Okay, then. Bye. 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 Bye.